Well, good morning and welcome back to the Shepherd's Word Church. We're so glad to be back to work again. We've uh, had quite a time here. Uh, me with the flu and and uh, Jody, she got exposed to that uh, that virus, uh, the COVID, and and uh, so I still don't have my voice completely returned, but we're doing much better. But this is such a special day today, even according to the Word of God. Most overlook it, don't realize exactly what God's Word has to say about this day. So um, I, I want to open with a, word, a short word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you have given us to remember the great and awesome miraculous events that we find in your word. We thank you, Father, that you have, that you have foretold us all things. It is written there for us to read and know and understand. We thank you, Father, that you are our teacher and that you teach us these things. We thank you, Father, for all things in Jesus' precious name. Now, amen. Uh, amen. And before we start this morning, uh, uh, I had uh, uh, friends visiting, and they come in and asked about the altar in front of the church, and they've never seen uh, an altar like this in a church. And usually, you know, a church has an altar; it's just a bench or a table or something. And uh, but. This is modeled after the altar in the tabernacle in the wilderness and the altar in the uh, King Solomon's uh, temple. The, uh, the, um, the, the uh, altar, now of course this is much smaller than what, what they had but and and what what uh, Moses uh, built and what uh, King Solomon had built, of course, was made with bronze and covered in gold, and we couldn't afford that. And that eternal fire that never goes out, it burns eternally, and it's the same fire that was in the bush, the bramble bush. It's a fire that would not burn a bush, but it devours evil and wickedness. It, and it's and it is supposed to it burns forever and ever, and it's always with God. And God uses the horns as symbols of power, and they're always on that altar. And in this case, because that altar, the uh, representing that salvation, those four horns pointing out to the four directions of the earth, north, east, south, and west. So that power of salvation encompassing the whole world to whomsoever will. So, you know, many people see the altar, and if you have not read the design of it in the, in the, uh, uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness or in the design in the, is that not working, Jim? No. I'm sorry. We're not recording? No. <clears throat> okay, well, we will uh, give us a minute then if anybody's hearing this. Well, Sherry's receiving it. Okay. It seems to be working, Jim. Okay, well, we will continue then. Sorry about the interruption. We're trying to make sure we get this recorded and um, so that uh, for posterity, so that you'll be able to go back and, and, and hear this in the future. And of course, we have had a lot of trouble with uh, the recordings and whatnot in the past. Uh, anything that man makes will break down. But as I was saying, that represents that altar, uh, that eternal fire that devours wickedness. So, but like I say, if you had read in the book of Exodus or, uh, or any, any of those books or in the Chronicles and Kings, you would know what that altar represents. So, but this particular day, now uh, this is the seventh day of Tibet. Now we're gonna be looking at a calendar and it is the restored ancient Hebrew calendar, not the modern day Jewish calendar, or they may call it a Hebrew calendar, but that's one that's been revised to kind of work in today's world. It follows after the Christian calendar as, as uh, Constantine had, had given to us. But this, and I'm gonna bring it out and show it to you in a minute, because I'm gonna show you some dates. 
It's the restored ancient Hebrew calendar. It's the most perfect calendar that could be designed because there's never a day, never moves on it. The seventh day is always the seventh day. The 15th day is always the 15th day. It never moves. It's truly by solar and by the 12 constellations, by the stars that were, that those stars contained the entire word of God, the whole Bible. And this is a, 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 a calendar that, that they dismissed and did away with. And uh, in, in Rome, the Church of Roman government uh, did away with it. But th it's today, it just seems, it, it does work out perfect on this calendar that the seventh of Tibet is December the 25th. And, and, it, and it works out that way. And so today what we're going to talk about are the, the traditions of men or the word of God. Because I hear so much today about people saying that God had to copy pagan uh, festivals and whatnot. God is the architect of the universe and he doesn't copy anybody. But there has been some confusion. And so we're going to ask, where will your heart be? With the traditions of men or with the word of God? And I want to talk about how the indisputable facts of truth can be so carefully buried and then so carelessly allowed to remain buried. And in most cases, it's right in plain sight, right in the Word of God and historical fact. And so we're going to look at the Word of God and historical fact. So, and, and when I say buried, it's buried under layers of falsehoods and traditions and the traditions of men is buried so deep with so many traditions of men and falsehoods that uh, you, can, you can overlook it, not even see it. Your mind cannot comprehend and receive the truth that's right there before you. But this day today, it, it, on, on God's calendar, a very special day according to the Word of God, a very joyous day. Now, it's not what the world teaches, because we're going to go to the Word of God and see exactly what today is. But on this day that the world calls Christmas Day, we're going to look to that Word of God and the established history. And we're going to plant some very important seeds of truth. So we're going to look, as I said, at God's calendar and we'll compare it to man's calendar. Now, looking at um, calendars, I'm, I'm not going to spend... Uh, uh, any time on this because uh, this is such a, a, a long study but um, the at the coming out of Babylon the Jews begin to use some forms of instead of just pure solar they use, begin to use some loony solar calendars and they incorporated some of the Persian Greek and Roman influence and the first Roman calendar introduced in 535 BC it had 304 days and then in 46 BC, Julius Caesar, he added 80 days and made the year 445 days. Uh, they had weeks that were at one point 10 days, and then eight days, and then eventually seven days. And the months uh, uh, named after uh, different gods and whatnot. But the calendar that they created in about the year, four, I think 1400, uh, uh, it had become 10 days off, and so they threw away 10 days. Now, in the United States, or actually in the Americas, they, we were not the United States yet, but the colonies and Great Britain in the uh, early 1700s, they had to remove 11 days out of the calendar and throw them away. So th in that year, uh, there, it went from September the 2nd to September the 13th. There's no, uh, those days don't exist. And there was so, so much confusion. And, you know, even uh, George Washington complained that his birthday uh, was changed. And let me see if I can see where it was. Uh, yeah, in 1752, there's when our calendar changed from September the 2nd, and the following day was September the 13th. And so George Washington, he complained that his original birthday of February 11th, 1731, was changed to February the 22nd, 1732. And many documents in those, in those at that time, they, they have 1731 slash 1732. They didn't know what year it was. And so, you know, when you look at things like that, you tell me what day it is. 
You know, who can figure it out? When is the Sabbath? But on God's calendar, it never moves. It's established every year by that spring equinox. It never moves. Seven days from the spring equinox is seven days from the spring equinox. Year after year for tens of thousands of years. And we're going to talk about today uh, some things that you can find in your companion Bible in Appendix 179 that has parallel datings of our Lord and it talks about the time of his birth and of course the course of Abaya and we're going to look at that because that is a fixed date and it tells you exactly according to God's word when Elizabeth conceived and we know exactly six months later the Virgin Mary conceived so we're going to look at, at some of those things we can't go over that, that thing but if you've got a companion Bible you're blessed because you can look at these things in, in Appendix 179 <clears throat> but we will, we will cover that. But I want to begin with Luke chapter 1 because this takes us to this very special day that we are here today on uh, the uh, December the 25th. And so let's pick it up with uh, Luke chapter 1. I'm going to go to verse, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. Now, on the calendar that I'm going to show you, there's all, and this was established even back with, uh, with Moses, and of course, again, in Chronicles uh, chapter 24, King David established it. But there's 24 courses and they run twice in the year. So the, all, the, all the different families were assigned two courses during the year that that certain family would, would serve in the temple or in the tabernacle. Now on the high holy days, those weeks, all the priests had to, to assemble. And so there's uh, three high holy days, but one took two weeks. You know, that, that's the Passover. They had to be here for two weeks. So 48 courses, 48 weeks, four, four more weeks for the holy days, 52 weeks. And they are set in stone. They do not move. And even as we read it, they, they, they are in the millennium. They are in eternity. So they never move. So he served of the course of Abiah, which was the eighth course. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And so to be a Levitical priest, you could not marry out of the Levitical family. And so even the, the wife had to be of the daughters of Aaron. The priests were, were of the sons of Aaron, and the wives had to be of the daughters of Aaron. And they were. And we'll find that this Elizabeth, that's Mary's mother's sister. And I, I know in the Bible it says her kinsman or, or cousin, but it's actually her aunt. But so we see that Mary, her father, was of the tribe of Judah, actually descended from King David of the king line. Her mother was of the daughters of Aaron, a Levite. And so that made Mary... Melka, which means king, and Zadok, which means the just or the priest line, Melka Zadok or Melchizedek, and that's why Christ was. It said that he was born after the order of Melchizedek, the king line and the priest line, because Mary did not conceive from man; she conceived from the Holy Spirit, and so that left her purely of Melka and Zadok, Melchizedek. And speaking of uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, verse 6, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And, and they both were now well stricken in years, way too old to have a child. 8. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest office before God in the order of his course, and that's the course of Abiah, the eighth course of the year, according to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of God. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. You can imagine but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. 
Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness. And many shall rejoice at his birth. This is going to be a miraculous conception. Because she's too old to bear children. They're both well too far in age to have children. But we're going to see two miraculous conceptions and those dates were known and remembered by the early Christians and kept and celebrated. Uh, 15, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And so he, he, he lived as a Nazarite and so did Christ and and, you know, there, there's many things that as a Nazarite, you like you don't cut your hair, you don't trim your nails, and there's and, and many things you don't do as a Nazarite. And so he was a, he lived as a Nazarite. But the Holy Spirit went with him from the time of his mother's womb. You know, when we're, when that seed enters the mother's womb, it carries with it, though microscopic, all of the intelligence, everything that who you will be, what you will look like, it's all encoded right there. It is flesh, though microscopic, but that's the day that you become flesh, that life enters. Your intellect comes with you. Your spirit comes with you. But the Holy Spirit was with him right from the very beginning. Also, 16, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him. In other words, he's the forerunner before the Christ. Before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And that's why he came to prepare the people for the Lord, that forerunner. 18, and Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. This, this can't, doesn't seem possible. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. Now for the sake of time, I'm going <clears> to <throat> drop down to um, uh, verse, uh, let me see here, verse 23. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. Now, of course, the, the courses ran from Sabbath to Sabbath. In other words, he, he, his course of Bible would, would begin on a Sabbath, and so he'd serve on that Sabbath day, and for the next six days, then the following day was another Sabbath, and that you could not travel on the Sabbath, so he'd have to wait until the following day to begin his journey home, which was about 30 miles for him, but he would begin his journey home. 24, and after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, verse 25, thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Now I'm going to show you this on the calendar here in, in just a moment. The, the, the day that he, con he was conceived in the womb. And it was always uh, the day, not the birth dates, uh, were, were not celebrated as much as the conception date because it was understood that that was the day that that soul became flesh. That spirit entered into the womb and became flesh. And the amazing thing is at that time, women knew when they conceived because that you can do it today and they're just now, uh, doctors are just now beginning to realize that if you follow you know, a woman's ministration and, and align it with the moon, you know exactly when your conception date is. And this they knew. And so the early Christians were remembering and celebrating the miraculous conception of Elizabeth. They were remembering and celebrating the miraculous conception of Mary because they were both miracles. And of course, the uh, church, uh, the, the church of the Roman government, trying to incorporate everything and knowing there were other, like, birth dates of other gods that happened about that same time, and they kind of incorporated them and, and it changed it from a conception date to a birth date. 
So uh, December, December the 25th was not, according to God's word, I'm going to show you, a birth date, but a day of a miraculous conception. And it is the word of God that we are following here. Now we read in verse 26, and in this sixth month, so exactly six months, we're talking 182 and a half days later, exactly, and you're going to see it on this this awesome calendar, how this works. And in the sixth month, 182 and a half days later, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. 28, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And of course, this had been foretold in the prophecies of God, and this is being fulfilled. 29, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. It's not that she didn't believe it. It's like, wow, how can this possibly be happening? 30, and the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And that name Jesus, it means Yahweh's Savior, or Yahweh the Savior. Because um, as, as, the, as the Lord will see, calls himself a, a great evergreen tree. And we're going to read that in Hosea. And he speaks of his children that have eternal life as, as those trees of his planting, those evergreen trees, because they don't die. They have eternal life. They don't like, they, they don't lose their, their leaves in the winter or they're eternal. And, you know, this one is called the branch, which is an extension. The, a, a branch is an extension of the tree itself. So Christ's coming is an extension of the Father himself in the flesh as the Son of God. And this was written even in the stars at the time of, uh, of Adam. And we may talk a little more about that later. But bring forth this child. <clears throat> 32. And he, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there shall be no end. So forever, king of kings, lord of lords. 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? I'm a virgin. I've never known a man. How can this be? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. So exactly six months into Elizabeth's, uh, con after her conception, Mary conceived. And so we, we're going to look at that course of Abiah and the date that that Elizabeth conceived, for whom, for with God nothing shall be impossible. This is a miraculous conception. 38, and Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the, and the angel departed from her. 39, and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. Now in the Greek it doesn't say in those days, it says in that day with haste. She was a young girl and she could cut it. She got up and she lit out and headed straight to Elizabeth because he had said that Elizabeth had also had that miraculous conception and she headed to her mother's sister's house in the hill country and it's something she could do. Like I say, it may, it may have been, you know, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly how far it was, but her, her youth, she was able to get there. 40, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Now, she didn't explain to Elizabeth anything, just more or less said, hello, uh, my aunt, and just saluted her. 41, and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, John the Baptist, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spake out with a loud voice, 
and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And the Holy Spirit, that's the very intellect of God when God's Spirit wraps around your spirit. And that's when you pray, he hears you and you hear him, that communication. And so she received knowledge from the Holy Spirit at that moment. And she knew all things without being told. And, when, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? 44, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. John the Baptist at the presence of Christ in the womb, though that little microscopic little seed still flesh with all the intelligence of who he would be, his character, his appearance, everything about him, all encoded in that tiny microscopic seed. And John, with the Holy Spirit, knew that Christ had entered into the presence. 45, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, 50. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation, that unmerited favor from generation to generation. Now I want to take a moment and show you just a bit on the calendar. I tried to make a large one so that, so that uh, you could see it. And uh, so let me set it up here. And I'll have to slide it back and forth so that the, so the camera can pick it up. But uh, if we begin with, um, the, you know, the calendar, the calendar runs this way, and it just circles around, begins anew every year. You know, there's never a day that moves, there's never a day that's lost, nothing is, is judged by the moons. Um, as far as, as days and times and events goes. But uh, we see here, of course, day 50, the Pentecost, and then the course of Abiah. Now this would be when Zacharias, at the eighth course, he would serve from this Sabbath all the way through, and he could not leave on this day, being another Sabbath, but the, then he would begin his journey home, which may take a couple days, but exactly 12 days later. Now the number 12 is extremely important in God's Word. You see it in the beginning of families and tribes and generations, just like the 12 tribes of Israel and, and of Esau, the 12 princes of Esau, time and time again. And it represents 12, that uh, perfect uh, spiritual governmental perfection. And so this was the beginning of a whole new government that government that would come with the building of the church and of Christ. And so he, he uh, Elizabeth received uh, that conception on the 12th day and, and, and uh, the 12 days from the time that, uh, that he left and, and, and on the 5th of Tammuz and five representing that unmerited favor, grace, unmerited favor. And then so if you count from that day and count exactly 182 and a half days, you come to Tibet the 7th, which is December the 25th, exactly, precisely. From that day to that day, 182 and a half days, so just as the Bible says, you can count from the, the conception of John, six, six months, exactly six months, to the conception of Christ. Now, if you continue to count, you'll find that John the Baptist was born on the first day of Passover. And so if you take from the conception of Christ and you count uh, the uh, 40 weeks or 280 days that time that a woman carries a child, that will bring you all the way around to exactly 280 days 
to Tishri the 15th, and this is precise, not missed by a single minute, but very day, the first day of the Feast of Trumpets. That's an eight-day celebration, the Feast of Trumpets. He was born, and this is equal today to our October the, the second. Now, in times of old, every generation has known this, but it's not taught because the traditions of men are too powerful that they call it, because Constantine called it a birth instead of a conception. But Christ was born on the most joyous, uh, holy celebration of the year, the first day. And he would have been uh, circumcised on the last final day of this great celebration on, on, and on the eighth day of that great celebration. So when he was born, when Mary made that trip, this was a time when all the harvest was in, all the work was done for the year. It was a time of just great celebration. Uh, they call it, some call it the Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Trumpets, the happiest time of the year. And that happiest time of the year, Christ began to dwell with man. He entered into the flesh on that December the 25th in his mother's womb and he, and he was born to be in the tabernacle with men on the first day of the Feast of Trumpets. And uh, so that is um, what the Word of God says. That is not tradition. And as I said, every every um, Every generation, there's always somebody who will actually read God's Word and know this, but you can try to teach it, but it doesn't go far because the traditions of men are too powerful for people to realize it. But in a lot of people's hearts, they know this to be true. Like, how could the, the shepherds have been out there in the cold snow? The sheep are not out there at that time of year. No, it wasn't. It was... But as, as I say, mo through most history, but man's calendar has got so many faults in it where even uh, Dr. Bullinger in, in, our, in my Bible had said September the 29th. But, you know, our, our calendar is, is full of flaws. And so, but it actually today, it falls on October the 2nd that Christ would have, would have been born. But today, December the 25th, is that day of that miraculous conception. Now, I want to, uh, let's turn to the book of Hosea because I want to talk a little bit about how and why we celebrate this day as we have through history. Now, let's go to Hosea chapter 14. And <clears throat> in Hosea chapter 14, the Lord is talking about that time of the great restoration when when the Lord's day has come and eternity has come all wickedness has been destroyed and removed from the world we are all in our true heavenly bodies no more wickedness exists and never will again exist and so he's talking about that time of that great restoration and I want to go to Hosea chapter 14 and uh, I'm going to pick it up with verse 4 as the Lord is talking about this. He says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. It's going to be a wonderful time, God dwelling with his children. For mine anger is turned away from him. He's done away with all the, the wickedness. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. And of course, again, God speaking of his children as those trees of righteousness and, and those of eternal life. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. And this is why we came here, verse 8. Ephraim, and, and Ephraim was one of the tribes of Israel that had really gone after a lot of Baal and idol worship, but that has been done away with. All has been restored. All has been forgiven. Wickedness removed for eternity. He says, Ephraim shall say, what have I to do with any more with idols? Ephraim will never go back to that again. 
<clears throat> the Lord says, I have heard him and observed him. And the Lord says, I am like a green fir tree, meaning I am like a great evergreen tree. That's why we bring at that this day that represents that miraculous conception, that tree that represents God himself, that great evergreen tree, that tree of eternal life. We as evergreen trees through him receive eternal life. But he himself told us thousands of years ago that I am like this is the way I am like a great evergreen tree. So that's why we bring out what we call a Christmas tree. And why the lights? Let's go to, let's go to uh, James chapter 1. And I want to uh, pick it up with verses 16 and, and 17. <clears throat> and, and James speaking to us. Uh, verse 16, chapter 17, I mean chapter 1, verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I'm going to read verse 18. Of his own will will beget he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This father of lights, his word, every single word contains light. And so we represent that, that he who is the father of lights, he who is the father of the words of truth. So even from ancient times, they had to use calendar, I mean candles, but lights were placed on this tree that represented he who is that great evergreen tree, the father of lights, truth. And so that's why we light that evergreen tree this time of year, remembering he who came with that miraculous conception. And, you know, I've heard so many recently, so many people talking about really trying to corrupt of the seed line of Jesus Christ. You know, because for thousands of years we have known exactly the protected seed line that Christ came in, beginning with that first Ethahadam, that first particular man, Adam, all the way down through the generations. God shows us generation by generation how he protected that seed line, and we saw exactly what he looked like. Early historians wrote letters telling exactly what Christ looked like. And then in these last days, I hear these so-called experts coming out and talking about, well, he was probably an Arab and he probably you know, looked like this dark skin, black hair. The Bible tells us what he looks like. History tells us what he looks like. So all of a sudden, these past few years, we have you know, an attack on the very lineage of Christ himself. You know, it's been uh, probably a couple years ago, but me and a couple of my uh, friends of a fraternity that I belong to, we were coming back uh, from uh, Little Rock, and they were talking about that, you know, that what Christ, they say that Christ looked, you know, dark complected, black hair, and looked like an Arab. And I said, what, you're wrong. I said, the Bible tells us what he looks like. And I begin to remind them what the word of God says. They said, you, you know, I forgot about that. People, truth is buried under the traditions of men and the false teachers. So, so today it is under such attack. And you've got to wonder why. So, you know, I, you see such the extreme effort being made today to, to totally confuse the ability to know the true Christ. We see that in, in, in so many teachings. But, and so these deceivers, they even go back and try to change the historical knowledge of Christ coming in the flesh. And, and, and you know, I, 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 like I have to wonder why so many false teachers are going to such extreme to paint over even our ancient knowledge uh, uh, about this family lineage of Christ that we have and even the appearance of what Christ looked like when he came in the flesh. Now, uh, he is not coming back in the flesh, but still that same appearance is there. 
in his in his glorious heavenly body is how he will be returning but you know satan must have his reason somehow to confuse need to confuse uh, and add to the confusion of those who are called the unlearned, those who have ignored God's word and are ignorant of God's word. And, of course, they love to attack, you know, what we have known through history. You know, the, those pictures that we saw painted of Christ through history, that we knew what he looked like. And I'll show it to you. It is in history, in the word of God and in history. Because So this word of God that we're going to uh, go to shows us great detail about this genealogy of Christ. I want to go to Genesis chapter 1 <clears throat> and I want to pick it up with verse 26. Now of course in in this God has created all the, the animals and the cattle of the earth. Not of the field of the earth. You will see that. And in verse 26 and it says, and God said, let us make man in our image. He didn't say, let me make man in my image. He said, let us make man in our image. Because God had destroyed that world that was at that fall of Satan and created this new world age, this time of our entering into the flesh, leaving that heavenly body and entering into flesh for this time of of salvation God said let us make man this word is Adam and it comes from the word Aduma from the soil let us make man from the soil to look in our own phantom image now God didn't make us all look exactly like him we're all different God made all the races just as he had originally made them in the very beginning in their own beauty and character and image and he, so he's saying, let us make man, let us make man from the soil to look exactly as we look. So you look exactly as you look in your heavenly body. We're born in that image. And it said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And this is like a phantom image. I mean, it's perfect. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God is, cre God is creating mankind and he's going to give them instructions how to live well off of the earth. Now this is not the garden, this is not the field, this is the earth. And you know some people, I mean they may want to call God a racist because he created all the races created each one in their own beauty and character. 27, so God created, and it says man in his own image. This, this word is not autumn. It's eth ha ha -dom. It's, It says the very specific man in his own image. There's only one created specifically in the image of God the Father, and that's God the Son. Just as Christ told the apostles when they said, Lord, show us the Father. He said, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You're looking at me, is what he told him. But God created that one, that extension, that branch that would come in the flesh in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Not them, they, him. He created him. Male and female, he created he them. So he created male and female of all the races. And 29, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth. Didn't say garden, it says earth. And every tree, in the, which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for meat. And to you, every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat and tree. And... You know, I'm going to go back and read verse 28. I missed that. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, because all had been destroyed. Replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God instructed them how to live well off the earth, hunters, fishers, gatherers. Now we go down to uh, chapter 2. Verse 7, <clears throat> and uh, now let me pick it up with verse 5. In chapter 2, verse 5, 
and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. He had, he had created all of these people, but he had not created a farmer. He did not have one to till the ground. This is that protected generation, that protected family that God is beginning uh, to that from whom Christ himself would come. So not every herb had been created. Not every plant had been created. God is going to make them here in this place. But he didn't have a man to till the ground, didn't have a farmer. Six, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed the man, not created as over here. Because man, mankind had been created. He formed this man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So with a body and a that breath of life or that spirit, you become a soul. They take two to make that, that third part. Eight, and God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had uh, formed. And let me see for time's sake here, uh, what do I, what I want to cover here? Let Let's jump uh, to verse uh, 18. And uh, now this, this man, uh, you know, I, I, let me go back to that, where it says that God formed, in verse 7, it said God formed man. This is also, and not Adam, but an Adam, a specific, very particular man. This is explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul explains, he talks about that first man and that's this Adam and then Christ as that second man. What he's actually saying is that first Ethahadam and Christ being the second Ethahadam. Very particular man, not from mankind, but that very particular man because this is a protected family from which all the generations that Christ would come from. So this is that very particular man and God placed in him all that DNA and all the specifics from the family that would carry over generation to generation to the birth of Christ, even in that DNA of Mary. Now let's pick it up with verse 18. And God and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him and out of out of the ground and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field did you hear that word field not earth field a, as a farmer, these are the domestic animals. He had created all the animals of the earth, the cattle of the earth, the wild animals. Now he's created a farmer and created all the animals of the field as a farmer. And But for Adam, there was not found and help me for him. 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Now this word rib is actually curve. The translator's not understanding that curve, like our helix curve, our DNA translated it as rib. Now of course there could be blood and bone taken, but God took, because he had created this one perfect DNA in this Eth ha Adam that began this family from which Christ would come from, he took from that same curve, that same helix curve, to create a woman. So of that same family. And and the rib or the curve which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 24, there shall, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, <clears throat> I want to show you some, some words that we are going to be looking at. And uh, Jim, if, if he would bring up the first one from the Strong's Concordance. 
It's word one, word number nine, 119 in your strongs. It's Adam. And this is that from that same one, that eth ha Adam. And it means to show blood in the face, as in flesh or turn rosy, to be dyed, made red or ruddy. And we're going to see the word ruddy used when it describes King David. But that means to have that rosy complexion. So you, you, you know what uh, a rosy complexion looks like. There is a family that has a rosy complexion that shows blood in the face. Then there's the word Adon, which, word number 122, which comes from that same word uh, 119 that we'll find used in God's word. It means rosy again, that rosy look, or red, or ruddy. And then we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and show it to you now. This is going to be described King David, word number 132, Admone. It comes from that same word, autumn. It means reddish, reddish of the hair or the complexion, to have a rosy complexion and have red hair. This is the family and the generation from which Christ came from. Not Arabic, not, because Arabic means mixture of dark and light. You know, the two are mixed together. It's kind of like evening or dusk is what it means. It means to be uh, t t uh, t t twined together. Now, um, I want to show you if we could have from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, and I've got, there's uh, two books here that have all the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they have all the, all the fragments in the Hebrew, and then, of course, the English translations. But the one that I wanted to show you is, is from uh, that book of Noah. And of course, there's many fragments, but in column one, it speaks of the marks of, on his hands and uh, the, uh, marks on his face. And it said, red is his hair, and he has moles upon his face. In other words, he has freckles. He's red-headed and freckled. And there's another place when it speaks of his eyes that some translated as having blue eyes. Now, of course, Lamech, his father, he was concerned about because the angels were seducing the daughters of Etha Adam, the, of Adam that time and creating giants. And so when they saw Noah, I mean, he was a spectacular looking child. I mean, there was a brightness about him that they were like worried, is he of the angels? But they went back and spoke to Enoch, and Enoch said, no, this is the one who will bring comfort, this Noah. So the Dead Sea Scrolls continue to talk about this family of that red hair and reddish complexion. Now let's go to, um, I want to go to uh, 1 Samuel and uh, <clears throat> let's see, 1 Samuel, and this is where um, Samuel has been ordered by God to go find this one uh, son of Jesse, because that's from where King David would come from, his father Jesse, David, and of course we're told that that was the very lineage, that king line from which Christ himself would come from. And uh, if you, as you read in, in 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 16, verses 10 and 12. Um, and again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And they're like, This is not the one the Lord sent me for. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are, are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. We're not going to give up until we find the one the Lord sent us for. Twelve, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, that's that word reddish, and withal a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now in the um, actual Hebrew writings, I, w I want to kind of read over it, and it reads from right to left. And, and past Jesse, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the, the English translation, and past Jesse, seven his sons before Samuel, but said Samuel to Jesse, has not chosen Jehovah. These among these, then said Samuel to Jesse, are all here. 
the young men. And he said, yet there remains the youngest, and lo, is he is tending the flock. Then said Samuel to Jesse, send and bring him, for not we will sit until he, he comes here. So he sent and brought him, and he was, and they translated the word ruddy, he was admoné, uh, with beautiful eyes and good form. That word admoné, that in the Hebrew, reddish of the hair, reddish of the complexion, a red-headed child, with red hair and a rosy red complexion. That's not Arabic, as the false teachers are attempting to try to distort the truth that is written in the Word of God. This is not traditions of men. This is the Word of God. So let's go to Isaiah uh, chapter 53. <clears throat> now this speaks of the beauty of this one who would come. And we're going to read some historical facts about him. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. He says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Two, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. This is speaking of Christ himself as he comes into the flesh. And as the root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This says that he is so beautiful. There's nothing that we could desire to add to his appearance. Now, I've had some pastors, I heard them say, yeah, that says he's ugly. They can't read. It says there's nothing more. His beauty and, and comeliness is so beautiful. There's nothing that we could hope to add to it. It's all there he is beautiful of perfect form our lord jesus christ in the exact image of our heavenly father beautiful so as he says he hath no form nor comeliness and there is no beauty that we should desire of him when we shall see him we see just such beauty that he stands out beautiful now i want to go to some very ancient writings and you know uh, I don't uh, have a lot of respect for that Roman government that existed I mean they were they were based on slavery and 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 uh, taken from others everybody was a slave until you bought your freedom or served in their army but one thing about the Romans and that what became the church of the Roman government they're good about keeping records you know, in that church, there's just volumes and volumes of letters, ancient letters, ancient writings that have been protected that anybody would love to get in there and, and be able to read some of these things. But they're in those ancient, very ancient writings. Now, these are thousands of years old. There's a letter from, uh, from uh, Pontius Pilate. And I'm going to read this. This is Appendix A. It says the physical appearance of Jesus, and this, this is two part. There's uh, two pages, and it tells us this is a reprint of a letter from Pontius Pilate to Tiberius Caesar, describing the physical appearance of Jesus. Copies are in the Congressional Library in Washington. So I mean, this is known. It's been with us all through history. He says a young man appeared in Galilee preaching with humble unction a new law in the name of God that had sent him. At first I was apprehensive that his design was to stir up the people against the Romans, but my fears were soon dispelled. Jesus of Nazareth spoke rather as a friend of the Romans than of the Jews. One day I observed in the midst a group of people, a young man who was leaning against a tree, calmly addressing the multitude. I was told it was Jesus. This I could easily have suspected, so great was the difference between him and those who were listening to him. His golden-colored hair, that, that reddish-blonde golden-color hair, not black as the modern-day, uh, uh, I guess uh, I, I, be I better not say it, but uh, 
uh, those experts are, are claiming his golden colored hair and beard gave to his appearance a celestial aspect. He appeared to be about 30 years of age. Never have I seen a sweeter or more serene countenance. Just as Isaiah 53 says, what a contrast between him and his bearers with their black beards and tawny complexions. Now I want to tell you who these are with the black beards and tawny complexions. Uh, Esau married one of the daughters of Ishmael. Ishmael was, you know, from that Egyptian. And of course, that gave us the Arab, the Arabic race. And those descendants of, of Ishmael and Esau, they lived in the south of Jerusalem or Judea, and they were not taken captive and taken to, um, uh, as, as many of the other tribes were not taken captive uh, to the, uh, you know, to, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, uh, well, I'll let that go. But they, they were allowed to stay there in that area. But when the Maccabees came and took power and defeated the Greeks, uh, these, they kind of come around and forced their religion upon everybody. So everybody in that area became Jewish or became a Jew by religion. But they, the Greeks, had called them Palestinians because they called the area Palestine. And so they were there, and they were those of that mixed race that they are still there today, the Palestinians. But these are those that he was talking about. So many that Christ were dealing with when the Bible says the Jews, they're talking about those who were Jews by religion and not by descendants of actually Judah who was descended from Jacob and Abraham and Noah and this uh, uh, Etha Adam. So this is who he's talking about. He didn't look like them. He says, unwilling to interpret him by my presence, I continued my walk but signified my secretary to join the group and listen. Later my secretary reported that never had he seen in the works of all the philosophers anything that compared to the teachings of Jesus. He told me that Jesus was neither seditious nor rebellious, so we extended to him our protection. He was at liberty to act, to speak, to assemble, and to address the people. This unlimited freedom provoked the Jews, not the poor, but the rich and powerful, because, you know, the, the rich and powerful, we're talking about those who had taken over the priesthood, the money changers, you know, they, they, they were really hurt when Christ came in and upset their, their little money changing business. Later I wrote to Jesus requesting an interview with him at the Petroleum. He came. <clears throat> when the Nazarene made his appearance, I was having my morning walk, and as I faced him, my feet seemed fastened with an iron hand to the marble pavement, and I trembled in every limb as a guilty culprit, though he was calm, for some time I stood admiring this extraordinary man. There was nothing in him that was repelling, nor in his character, yet I felt awed in his presence. I told him that there was a magnetic simplicity about him and his personality that elevated him far above the philosophers and teachers of his day. <clears throat> this is the second page. All in all, he made a deep impression upon me and everyone because of his kindness, simplicity, humility, and love. Now, noble sovereign, these are the facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth, and I have taken the time to write you in detail concerning these matters. I say that such a man who convert water into wine, change death into life, disease into health, calm the stormy seas, is not guilty of any criminal offense as and as others have said, we must agree, truly, this is the Son of God. And, and uh, Pontius Pilate, knowing that, he didn't want to see Christ crucified. He tried to get them to not, not let him be crucified. And he thought, well, let him be punished, and maybe that will satisfy him. But, but they wanted him put to death. And they said, let his blood be on us. And he said, I wash my hands of it then. And, you know, he allowed them. Now, this Appendix B... This is another extremely ancient letter. It says the following description, it's just a description of Jesus Christ, the following description of Jesus Christ was written by Publius Lentrellis. Spelling may not be correct as writing was indistinct 
a resident of Judea in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So he lived at that same time as Pontius Pilate and, and that same Tiberius Caesar in power that in the reign of Tiberius Caesar in the monarch in Rome. So he was there a first-hand eyewitness. It first appeared in the writings of St. Anselm in, of Canterbury in the 11th century. So though it was had, it was written at the time of Christ, it didn't actually become known amongst everyone, was not turned loose and shared until uh, the 11th century. But I mean, we're still talking a thousand years ago that it really became public. So this is ancient. He wrote to him, he said, there lives at this time in Judah a man of singular virtue whose name is Jesus Christ, whom the barbarians esteem as a prophet. And anybody who didn't speak your language, they were a barbarian. That's the way people, that they spoke about each other. But his followers love and adore him as the offspring of the immortal God. He calls back the dead from the graves and heals all sorts of diseases with a word or touch. He is a tall man and is believed to be about six foot four. Well shaped and of an amiable and reverent aspect. His hair of a color that can hardly be matched, falling into graceful curls, waving about and very agreeable, crouching upon his shoulders, parted on the crown of his head, running as a stream to the front after the fashion of the Nazarites. And he did, he lived as a Nazarite. His forehead high, large and imposing, his cheeks without spot or wrinkle, beautiful with a lovely red that rosy complexion think about the family that you see with that rosy complexion red hair and freckles it was beautiful a lovely red his nose nose and mouth formed with exquisite symmetry his beard and of a color suitable to his hair reaching below his chin and parted in the middle like a fork his eyes bright blue. This is an ancient, ancient letter. His eyes bright blue, clear and serene. Look, innocent, dignified, manly, and mature in proportion of body most perfect and captivating. His arms and hands delectable to behold. He rebukes with majesty, counsels with mildness. His whole address, whether in word or deed, being elegant and grave, no man has seen him laugh, yet his manners are exceedingly pleasant. But he has wept frequently in the presence of men. He is temperate, modest, and wise, a man for his extraordinary beauty and perfection, surpassing the children of men in every sense. And that's why, you know, when we were young, we saw all the pictures painted of Christ matching these ancient, ancient descriptions. It wasn't until the last 25 or 30 years that we had all those false, pat those false teachers coming out and saying that, oh, he, he couldn't have looked like that. He had to look like an Arab and all these kinds of things, you know, attacking the truth. But we have the word of God. We have the ancient writings. So these modern day critics who come forth and start saying that, that uh, Christmas Day, that's something that they copied after some other uh, religions and whatnot. God doesn't copy anybody. It's in the Word of God. I showed you the calendar, that perfect calendar, that today is a very special day that represents a miraculous conception that Christ entered the flesh. And then in that 280 days, exactly 40 weeks, on that great day, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacle, that great and joyous event of the year that he began to tabernacle with men. This is the word of God. So enjoy this day. Celebrate this day. It's a special day according to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we truly do love you, Lord, and we thank you, Father, that you love us, that you would give us these truths, that those who are ignorant of your word have, cannot attack us, that we may pick up the sword of the, the Spirit, the word of God, and put them in their place, Lord. We thank you, Father, and give all praise, honor, and glory to you that you have written these things and have given these things, that you have sent this one 
to, to enter into the flesh, to die for our sins and take away the sins of the world and to be returned to that throne, King of kings and Lord of lords forever and ever. Amen.